Hey, the Wi-Fi went out. Can you fix it? Okay, I can help. We've been running Windows Server on our home router for quite a while now, and we've had a lot of issues with it. So today, we're going to take our so setup from this, this to this. Let's get started. Hours later. It's been a few hours now. We've removed the old shelf and all the stuff that was on it. But da, 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 the new cabinet is installed. We managed to fit everything in. So we got our 3D printing supplies down there. Management here. Uh, printing more filament there. Some network stuff there. More cables up here. More ubiquity stuff. And this, this new box, which we'll be getting into uh, in a little bit. Several days later. So it's been a few days now. Let's go ahead and get these hard drives set up, and I can go over what the specs on the server are. Specs on this server, we are running dual uh, Xeons. I'll have the specs on screen right here. We are running a 250 gigabyte boot drive. A 500 uh, gigabyte uh, cache drive. This will hold our most often stored files it's because the rest of this is spinning rust, so it's going to be a little slower. And then we have 12 terabytes of raw hard drives. These are Seagate uh, compute drives, Barracuda computes. They're fairly reliable and they were fairly cheap. That was one of the major things when I uh, was purchasing them. In addition, we have 128 gigabytes of 2400 megahertz DDR4 registered memory. So we have we have an error correction built on the modules. Um, overall, we, we have 20 cores and 40 threads of CPU horsepower. They're older cores, so they're not as fast as like my Threadripper, but they should be sufficient for a hard drive based file server and for maybe some like light mine, modded Minecraft packs. Like that, let's go ahead and get the monitor and USB hooked up. At some point, I'm gonna get a USB extension cord so I don't have to lean down like this. But until then, we're just gonna do it this way. Unplug my VGA extension cord. Let's power this sucker on. I should note, uh, servers are a little bit louder than consumer heart fans, because uh, they're normally thrown into a closet somewhere where, you know, you're not often going to be around them. We're going to have to do a few things before we can install TrueNAS, which is the operating system we're going to be using. It's going to be a ZFS-based box, so we've got to change a couple settings. This box has iDRAC support, which is Dell's implementation of IPMI, which is a remote management thing that allows you to, like, change BIOS settings over the network and a bunch of other things. The previous company likely had this configured, so we're gonna go ahead and tweak some of that. I bought this from a company that was doing a hardware refresh, so, which is often where you can find these. Like if you see a company, you can probably, I mean, in most cases you can ask like, hey, are you doing a hardware refresh? If so, can I buy some of the hardware you're gonna be disposing of? Because otherwise it's gonna go to eBay or in, in this box's case, it was gonna go to e-waste. So nobody would have been able to use it. But you can also find these boxes on eBay for relatively cheap. At the time uh, I last dug into this, you could find a box similar to this, not the exact same CPU memory or storage. Um, you could find a Dell server somewhat similar to this for a few hundred bucks. That is without memory though. The memory in this, I spent about 350 bucks on eBay for, which is pretty good compared to Amazon's 500. <laughs> So iDRAC didn't work out for us, but that's not a problem because we can just do this through the shell. And then after that, we can go ahead and, you know, configure it. So we're gonna install onto our 250 gigabyte SSD. 
This will erase all partitions, so just make sure. Enter root password, and then this is gonna be a password that I come up with. So it's asking us if we want to create a swap. This is similar to a page file on Windows. I don't think it's really necessary because we have 128 gigs of RAM, so we are not going to do that. So now it's gonna go ahead and do the setup, and we just gotta wait a moment. So a few minutes later, the installation has finished, and we're here. So now we can go ahead and set our configuration, or we can go ahead and log into the web interface, which is shown on screen. So yeah, I'm gonna head over to the web interface and we're gonna set that up. Meet you guys there. And like that, we're back over here and we're gonna go over to the IP address that was provided. And then we're gonna go ahead and log in with the credentials that were created. So now we're in the TrueNAS interface. I've gone ahead and signed in and changed some network settings just to make my life easier. We could see here information about what our uh, network connection is. We could see our IP address, which I am blurring. Um, we could see the amount of memory available in the system, along with the ZFS cache, which is automatically set up. We can see our amount of CPU usage and we can see information about our system. You can go ahead and reorder some things. You can add extra buttons into this UI, like monitoring in individual network interfaces. So you can see how much speed is going through it. But we still need, we don't have any storage. This box is currently doing nothing. We need it to do something. So we're gonna go under storage and we're gonna create a pool. We're gonna go ahead and select all of the drives that we wanna put into this pool. That would be all six of these. And we're gonna give this a name. I'm just gonna name it uh, default pool. I'm gonna put an underscore there just to make sure I can access it in a one line. So now we're gonna set this to a RAID Z2. It's gonna use two drives for parity data. This will give me two drive failures. So I can pop two of them out. And as long as I get at least one in there before another dies, I'm fine. And it'll just rebuild. It will be slow because it is hard drive based, but you can see here, we're gonna get a ca capacity of roughly seven terabytes. It's a little below the eight I would have liked, but that's due to, you know, how it's categorized Tibby bytes versus um, terabytes there is a difference one of them is a thousand megabytes the other is a thousand and twenty four megabytes so yeah so we're going to go ahead and create this pool contents of the disk will be saved you're going to want to check this checkbox and hit create zfs is a file system at its base so you don't have to go and make like ntfs or ext4 file system it will do that automatically for you you can also minimize this page if you want to go and do other things in the background. And you can click up here in the task manager to go ahead and monitor it. Under shares, this is where you would make the shares that people will have access to. You can see my pool is already created here because it's just finished. So I could go ahead and add a data set. This is what actually holds the data. There are a few other settings we can change on here. For instance, we could change the compression level. Given I have 40 threads of uh, CPU horsepower and this is hard drive based storage, I think compression should be fine. Um, if, that, if that isn't the case, I can change it in the future. You can also set up deduplication, though I would note this does use a lot of memory and it permanently affects how data is stored. You cannot turn this off once you put data on, or well, you can, but, you could, but you'll lose your data. So I am not going to turn this on. I am gonna host a bunch of VMs, but the amount of data they use is fairly negligible. So I've gone and made sure that compression is turned on. A team, I'm not sure what it is. Oh, this allows you to, okay, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't care about this. There are also advanced options where you can change a bunch more ZFS settings. But for me, I don't think this is gonna be a huge deal. So we're gonna save. And now we gotta go ahead and add a data set. This is the actual storage area. So this will this is where you can set whether case sensitivity is a thing. So if you are using a Linux file system, you wanna set this to case sensitive because upper and lower case are different, or you can set it to mixed. But for a Windows based share, you would want to set this to insensitive. You can also set this up as an SMB share if you like under share type. Now, in my case, I'm actually not going to do this because I think oops, our pool for apps is going to be default pool because we're just going to dump everything on there and you can install things like Plex or Nextcloud. So I want to run Nextcloud directly off of my TrueNAS box because instead of hosting an Ubuntu server VM and then using a snap to run Nextcloud under that, I can just run Nextcloud directly. 
this makes my life a lot easier. So I can just, once it actually fetches all the data, I can go ahead and click the install button. Nextcloud is up and running and I just give it an IP address. And for Nextcloud, I will have a few tutorials in the future and also a couple videos about my experience with Nextcloud using it for editing and for bulk video storage, which is going to be very interesting. I'm gonna, um, that's gonna be fun because on my box, I have um, a lot a lot of video footage. I've had to buy an entire extra hard drive strictly because I don't want to delete any of this footage. Being able to back this up and remove this storage from my computer is going to be a huge help. This is going to be a massive help. Free up a terabyte of storage on my computer and all my files are here. And then I'm going to set up a cloud backup from Nextcloud to, you know, say Microsoft Azure. So we're going to use the default pool and then we can click install on next cloud and we have to give it a name. So we're going to give this a name of next cloud. We can choose which version we're using. Oh, there's only one choice right now. And then we can change some settings for next cloud. I'm going to use the free NAS default certificate because that'll give me HTTPS, which gives me encryption both ways. We can give it an IP address for how we access it. Um, I'm not sure what it means because it defaulted to the same IP as the true NAS box. I don't know what it exactly means. I'm going to try this at the default and see what happens. Um, no, I'm going to change this to the next IP over because that one is also free and that's what I would have intended to use it on. You can also set up your credentials for next cloud. So I'm going to leave admin and I'm going to set up a new password and then we could give it a port to use. So this is where our data would be stored. We're going to leave it at the default just because that should be fine. So we're going to click next. We're going to use default settings here. DNS should be fine. And we're going to go ahead and click save. So application name does need to be lowercase. So I'm going to go ahead and jump back down and confirm and hit save. So this will automatically install and it should just have access to the full pool. There we are. We're all set and we can look at our installed applications. Right now it's deploying, but we should be able to go ahead and jump onto it once it is done. So this seems to be running off of Docker. We can go ahead and view information about it by just clicking on it. We can see events that are going on, the versions of everything. We can see that next cloud is being set up. You also have access to virtualization over here. So you can add a VM and so you can have a lot of fun with that. And you can do GPU pass through with TrueNAS because this uses KVM as its base. So that was one of my problems with Hyper-V is its GPU pass through wasn't great, honestly. So yeah, there's a lot of settings in here where you can set up snapshots, you can set up R syncs, you can do this to Azure as well. So if, uh, there's a couple services that let you just punch in a TrueNAS and you can just go to Azure directly from it. That's probably what I'm going to do. So then I could back up all these eight terabytes straight to Azure and make sure, you know, I have a I have a copy of it. So why did I go with TrueNAS scale over TrueNAS core? Well, I mostly went with it because of this. We have Docker images, which lets me do things like Nextcloud, Plex and a bunch of other things just really, really easily. So I'm currently deploying Nextcloud because that's what I'm currently using for backing up and doing cloud saves between certain games. Um, I was having my hand too far forward there, but I have a st Steam Cloud Sync set up for like space engineer saves and I have it set up for like clips, like all my uh, little things I do. Um, you know, all the little like, oh, funny sounds, haha. Uh -huh. um, my Vegas render templates. So I can sync them between multiple computers and also for, you know, D&D characters, which is something I'm doing uh, totally. So I have confirmed that the default IP address that it pulls for Nextcloud uh, is the one it's it has access to. So I need to actually change this over back to the same IP as the true NAS box. So that is going to take a moment to go ahead and update. And then we'll have to manually restart the box and then it's going to go ahead and take some time to deploy, but it should be accessible at the specified port once it is done. In this case, it is 9001. So a little bit later, and we can now click the web portal button, go through this privacy warning, and now we can log in with the credentials we provided during the configuration. And now we have our standard Nextcloud configuration. 
So I've gone through this once before. It lets you go ahead and, you know, see all the settings. There's an app store. It lets you get your app. You can get it on f or Google Play. And there's also a desktop Linux. You know, there's a bunch of settings. And then you can just start using it. There's a bunch of files put on there by default, which I'm going to go ahead and delete at some point. Um, there's a bunch of random crap that we don't need. And I'm going to go ahead and delete all of them. But yeah, Nextcloud is set up and running a lot easier than if I had gone through and set it up uh, manually. So, yeah. So, so there's one last thing we need to do regarding our storage, because right now we're running just bare spinning rust. And we can see our applications are here. We're just running bare spinning rust. That's, you know, that may be fine, but we have a, we have a cache drive. We want to go ahead and set that up. So we're going to go into storage and we're going to want to go under our pools section. We want to configure and we want to add a VDAV in order to add our cache or ARC. So we're going to go ahead and click this and we're going to add this as a cache or L2 ARC. This will be used to speed up read, op read operations on, uh, on files we access frequently. Now, if we're going to be running um, like Nextcloud to store everything, that shouldn't be super necessary. But if we're running something like a Steam cache, this would be a very nice thing to have. Or if we're just directly running off of Samba, which we're not, but we could be. So we're going to select our drive and we're going to add it to the cache VDEV and we're going to add the VDEV. Make sure you click in the arrow next to cache VDEV and not the one next to data VDEV. So now it still shows that we're on our same pool, but we have a cache VDEV and I believe we can view that if we go under status. Yes, we can see our cache VDEV right here and we can view status about it. We can take the device offline if we need to. We can extend it. We can add more drives if we want more cache, but for right now we're fine. And just like that, we have a configured TrueNAS setup. So, yeah, thank you guys for coming along for this. Um, hope you might have learned something, because I certainly did while doing this. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.